Good afternoon. See people populating the room. Good afternoon and make, welcome to <laughs> make your NADP data meaningful. Um, I see, again, a lot of repeat names, but if you can go ahead and introduce yourself and say where you're joining us from in the chat box um, and make sure that you're addressing all panelists and attendees um, where that two, there should be a little drop down arrow rather than just all panelists. Lots of repeat names. Hello, West Virginia and Virginia. Hi, Phyllis. <laughs> Project literacy, great. Hi, Ramona. <laughs> Awesome. Hi, Grayla. Lots of our team. Awesome. So while you guys are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and launch our normal poll. Um, I don't know why I did a silly thing and didn't put um, NEDP advisor assessor as one of the choices on here. So I apologize for that. So if there's other, I guess that would be the place for you to put that. Awesome. So I'm going to share the results here. So other probably <laughs> encompasses a, a, some NEDP advisor assessor program administrators. Um, so I apologize for that little error. But uh, good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our fourth and final day of the Virtual Training Institute. Um, my name is Gina Davis and I'm an education program specialist and um, professional development coordinator with the Maryland Department of Labor. Um, we're really, really happy to be able to offer this virtual training institute, um, especially because as we can see here, a lot of people are joining us not only here in Maryland, but elsewhere. And I think there's just so much power in peer sharing and um, adult education has been really wonderful in developing um, an atmosphere for sharing. So um, please take, you know, any moments to ask any questions or anything that you need in that chat box. And just remember to address all panelists and attendees. Um, once you select it once, it should default to that in your chat. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to my two incredible colleagues. We're just very luck lucky here at Team Labor to have such a great team. Um, my colleagues, Doug and Bio, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Gina. Hello, everyone. Um, Welcome to our presentation on uh, using NEDP data for meaningful programmatic uh, decision making. Uh, my name is Bayo Adetunji. I'm the NEDP coordinator and also an education program specialist at the Maryland Department of Labor. Before having Doug introduce himself, I would like to say once again that I'm really excited that NEDP, the National External Diploma Program, has finally come to the Virtual Training Institute. We, we did have a session on Monday that provided an overview of NEDP, especially for those um, in our local program areas who are not necessarily NEDP practitioners, but who would who essentially touch NEDP learners, um, but they're not very familiar with NEDP. I hope you found that uh, session very informative. Uh, today, in today's presentation, we will be looking at the various sources of information and data that are available to NEDP providers in the field and how you uh, can actually use the data to make decisions uh, for continuous improvement. So, Doug? Yes, so hello everyone. My name is Doug Weimer. I'm also an adult education program specialist with the Maryland Department of Labor. And I'm, um, I'm a kind of the point person for data analysis and also using our state data system. So I'm really excited today that we can kind of bring together practitioners of NEDP, as well as uh, MIS and other data entry staff um, and data analysis staff to talk about how we can use uh, data with uh, the National External Diploma Program. So welcome. Um, the presentation today is going to use Poll Everywhere, so I want to take a moment and pause on this slide. Uh, feel free to either enter that website, uh, you can also text, um, or the easiest thing, if you have your smartphone handy, is you can just uh, bring up your photo app um, and 
kind of take a picture of this QR code. And on most uh, modern smartphones, it'll actually ask if it wanted to take you to that website. So if you just take a moment and go ahead and log into Poll Everywhere, um, you can also do it in a, a separate uh, window on your browser. Okay, so who's here? So we have um, a little poll that actually will ask you what your role is in NEDP. So we wanna know for sure who is uh, in the room with us today. So if you could, uh, using the Poll Everywhere app, if you could either indicate whether you're a program administrator, uh, if you're an NEDP advisor assessor, if you're in MIS or other data entry role, if you're an intake assessment specialist, or if you have another uh, role as it relates to NEDP, we'd like to get a feel for who's here. So if people are looking for the link. Um, I also copied it or I wrote it in the chat box. So if you want to copy and paste the pollev.com dash Douglas W538, you can copy and paste that into a different browser and that should work for you guys. Um, and the question will populate for you as soon as you put it in. Looks like we're getting some results now. And for those of you out of state, please feel free to still um, answer this question. Uh, if the MIS term is not something you use in your state, that's just management information system specialist. So this would be uh, the person in charge of data analysis and data entry. And of course, IAS would be the intake assessment specialist. Okay, so at this point, it looks like we have about a third of you are directly in the NADP program, either an advisor assessor, and a quarter of you are in the MIS or data role, which is great, uh, as well as a third of you almost that are in um, a non-role of the uh, ones that we listed. So that's great. It's a nice mix that we have here today. So I'd like to go on to the next question, and this is still on poll everywhere. So if you have it up, you can just keep it up. It should go to the next question. Um, when it comes to data and the NADP program, what data do you wish that you had or that you had more of on your NADP program or on your NADP participants? So just, you know, you can put a few words or sentence, one word answer, doesn't matter. But what data do you wish that you had or that you wish you had more of when it comes to your NADP program? And it's okay if you don't have an answer for this, or if your answer is that you have all the data you need, that's fine. Not sure is a perfect answer. That's what we're here to talk about today, is what data we do have. I, I sort of want to plug a little thing. I guess when I try to compare it to other programs, um, the thing that I find really interesting is the MSG relation is sort of, I guess, not adequate enough in terms of like what leads to an MSG with them is a little, I don't I would say different than instruction. So I guess extrapolating on that would be. Yeah, I think the instruction difference is really the a big difference between NEDP and the rest of a traditional adult ed program, of course, is that um, a lot of the data analysis we do with adult basic ed, English language acquisition and so forth focuses so much on the quality of instruction. With NEDP, that is not quite what we're looking at. We're looking at more enrollment data, completion data and so forth. So it's just, it's a little different. So thank you all for being honest. I appreciate all the not sures. That's perfectly fine. I wanted to know where everyone at was at before we uh, kept going. We do have one here. Uh, testing data for continuing students. Good, great. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on. And we're going to go over today's objectives. So first of all, we want to do a little bit of getting to know you, which we just completed. 
Um, and then Bayou is going to walk us through just a very brief summary of what the National External Diploma Program is. Uh, based on the roles that you assign for yourself, uh, I'm pretty sure that we have the right crowd here. I think everyone knows what NEDP is, but just to be safe, we want to make sure that we go through what those roles are and that you understand the program. And then we want to talk about the challenges we're facing with NEDP. And then I'm going to go in, in depth into common reports that are available both uh, with the National External Diploma Program, as well as with um, the general adult basic ed and English language acquisition population. And then some unique reports we can get out of the NEDP system. We'll go over how you can use those reports and do some analysis and also some planning for program improvement. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Bayo. Thank you, Doug. So let's look at um, the National External Diploma Program. Go to the next slide, please. Usually when I talk about the National External Diploma Program, um, I know here right here, based on the audience that we have today, I'll be preaching to the choir, but as Doc said, you'd never really know. So I'll go ahead and do it anyway. Um, just in case you're not familiar, Maryland has offered NEDP to um, adult learners uh, 18 and over since NEDP was instituted in the late 70s. It leads to a Maryland high school diploma, and that's one of the cool things about NEDP. Now, the GED testing is um, it's a test that everybody is very familiar with. But sometimes in my interactions with people, when I mention the National External Diploma Program, NEDP, what I hear is, and what? So it's not um, a series of tests that an, an individual takes and lists and, and then they obtain a, a high school diploma, but it's competency-based. And this is um, a program, a performance assessment system that is approved by the state of Maryland as a legitimate um, way for an individual to demonstrate their skills essentially uh, to obtain a high school diploma. Now, NEDP, one of the unique things about NEDP and one of the reasons that we're frankly talking about uh, using NEDP data uh, today is the fact that it's non-instructional in that this um, learners, participants do not come in to take certain tests and prepare uh, to complete the program, but have, they still need to meet certain cut scores. Um, so it's, it's a, little, um, a little bit more challenging from the point of view of performance improvement. For instance, from the point of view of the assessors and, ad and the advisors working with NEDP learners. So NEDP, as I indicated, has certain requirements that the applicant needs to meet. Uh, they need to meet certain course course in reading, writing, and math. And um, it, it also provides an opportunity where you are able to demonstrate the skills that you have learned and show those skills off as you were. NEDP, I should also add, is owned by CASAS. It's proprietary to CASAS and is federally and state funded. One of the important things as well is that even though NEDP is not instructional based, but because it's federally and state funded, we still need to meet OCTA reporting requirements. NEDP learner outcomes are reported in LACES. I mean, they are, are recorded in LACES and they are reported just like your ABE and ESL learning outcomes are, um, report, are reported to OCTA. So in that respect, OCTA also expects us to uh, focus on performance improvement. Whether you like it or not, your NEDP learners show up on the tables, uh, your tables four and 4B, like, um, Doug will be talking about that early, I mean, later on, they show up there. When NEDP learner make, uh, when the learners make gains, you know, th those gains kind of affect our bottom line. So it is important as well for, for us to focus on how we make decisions about NEDP uh, uh, performance improvement so that we're using uh, data, all the da available sources of data to make that decision. And I've also included uh, our website and our brochure and a link also to the uh, CASAS website in case you would need ad additional information. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some NEDP data challenges and some room for improvement. So uh, why now? Why are we talking about this now? Well, um, as I said before, um, my role in the state is to focus on data analysis and so forth when it comes to reporting. Um, and I found that a lot of what we hear from the NEDP program is a lot of anecdotal evidence. And I'm not saying the anecdotal evidence isn't useful, it really is useful. But I think it's always important to make sure that anecdotal evidence you get from 
um, you know, talking to other programs, talking to your participants and so forth, really needs to be backed up with actual data and trends. Um, now there's definitely a gap between them. There is a limit to what we can get out of the NEDP system and also our, our state data system. But to the extent that we can we really should focus on the actual data and trends. Um, and in addition, something that Bio just alluded to was the need to improve our local and state measurable skill gains. Um, it has a funding impact. The National Storm Diploma Program in Maryland, while it is a smaller group of students compared to the, the rest of the program, it still does have an impact on our measurable skill gains for the state, especially for those students that the National Storm Diploma Program is a better choice for them than say the GED pathway. So it has a funding impact. Now, some of the other issues that we wanna look at today is one of them is data quality. Now, let me just stop here for a moment. Um, since we have so many people um, in the presentation that are not from Maryland, I just wanna point out that anytime I use the term LACES, LACES is the data system that Maryland uses uh, for all of our adult education information and also for reporting. So anytime you see LACES in here, just substitute it in your head for whatever local data system you have um, and the same information should still apply. So one of the challenges is that we have NEDP data um, that comes in, but it has kind of two pathways. So as the students are completing uh, their NEDP, uh, doing their competencies and so forth, um, in meeting with the advisor assessor, that information is being entered into the My NEDP system, the CASAS database. So as they complete a competency, it gets recorded automatically in the system, and that's how that data is recorded for CASAS's purposes. But separately, information that, of course, for LACES has to be given to the Management Information System Specialist, the MIS, in order to be put into LACES. And we always see that there's a discrepancy between these two systems, the CASA system, IEDP, and the state database LACES. And so one of the reasons why we wanna look at data is we wanna make sure that we're minimizing that as much as possible. Some of that is just timing. Of course, when a student completes a competency, it's in NEDP already. And when they complete this, the program, it's in there. But of course, we have a delay of getting that information to the MIS to get into LACES. So we wanna make sure that we're utilizing both systems so we can identify data errors. Now I have Bio talk a little bit about data for PD planning. Thank you, Doug. Um, so it's important as we indicated, as I indicated earlier that we know that NEDP is unique, but we don't want to just stop right there. It is unique, but it's part of the whole adult education system. And NEDP outcomes impact our bottom line. Like I, as I said, when we report data to Octe, NEDP learners are included in that, in that data. So as we're taking a very close look at uh, ABE and ESL uh, learners, we also need to do the same thing for NEDP um, uh, learners as well. So that's essentially my pitch. So uh, perhaps this is just a few questions for us to think about. If you want to address these questions in the chat, that's fine. Why do we need PD planning for NEDP? After all, um, actually in Maryland, perhaps I should mention um, as well that we have 11 NEDP local providers who are grantees in Maryland. Out of, all of the 11 grantees that we have, only one NED provider is, um, does not include um, ABE and ESL with uh, providing NEDP for, for learners. What I'm saying is that all of the other providers also provide um, ESL and ABE instruction. So, well, I'm already kind of focusing on the ABE and ESL learners. Why should NEDP be different? So. Also, um, along those lines, I want us to think about the steps that are involved uh, currently in your local program, in your PD planning. Is it any something that is basically random? Um, because I'm uh, addressing mostly people who are NEDP providers here, we know that in Maryland, we have historically depended on CASA um, and the state, NEDP statewide meeting as well as our main source of professional development activities. And perhaps uh, there's a reason for that because the program is um, as a, a standardized assessment, it's owned, um, the curriculum is owned by CASAS and all our advisors and assessors are supposed to meet certain um, requirements in order to become certified. And also NEDP is a standalone program in, in that the publisher would, um, it's, it's one of the requirements that the program has to be operated according to the 
guidelines, the policies and procedures manual that uh, CASAS, had insisti uh, CASAS instituted. That's one of the reasons that um, we, we kind of rely on them. Now, our advisors and assessors completes almost, I think it's a 20 hour uh, professional development, not professional development, but the certification course where they, they become certified. But we know that um, especially for uh, newer programs, uh, because we did, we actually do have a new program this year at the Howard County Library, you would realize that becoming, completing that whole certification requirement is not, in, it's just the beginning um, of what you need to be to be confident, to be able to um, actually work with a client. You need that uh, additional professional development uh, activities for you to build that confidence and be able to develop experience in your in being able to evaluate uh, client's competencies. So I'd like us to kind of think about the stuff, uh, the steps that are involved in that process for us at the local level. CASA sends out, um, one of their publications, the NEDP News, that's what we have come to depend on for uh, professional development activities. And I'm not saying that, and that's great. They offer a, a, quite a bit throughout the year. So for some of us, perhaps it's a bit random, you know, maybe this month for the month of December, maybe CASA is offering two professional development activities and that's all. Because CASA is offering it, that's what I'm going to take anyway. It doesn't really matter whether that's my need. So also the top question that I wanted to think about is that how do we currently use data for PD planning? Do we use data at all or as I indicated, or is it just if something catches my fancy, if it has any DP in it, then that's probably good enough. So I'd like us to think, take, take some, um, just kind of think about those in a minute. Um, Doug, please move to the next slide. So, As I indicated, there are two aspects there. Um, the aspect of planning for staff PD is one aspect of using data for, for performance improvement. In case you're not familiar with NEDP, the um, uh, professionals that work with the NEDP clients, with NEDP participants are called advisors and assessors. There is no separate training for somebody to become certified as an as assessor or advisor is the same training once you go through, the same person can act in the same capacity. The same person can act as an advisor, as an assessor, and as, as a portfolio reviewer. It's just that they have to be different for the same client. So in thinking about our PD planning, it's important for us to become familiar with our NEDP goals. Depending on your role in your local program, you may not realize the fact that your local program has already negotiated um, some performance outcomes with the state. For instance, at the end of the year, I'm going to recruit um, maybe 10 or 50 prospective NEDP clients. And I'm going to actually, um, in, you know, during the intake process, I'm going to bring in 50, a certain number of NEDP learners. So what I'm saying here in essence is that depending, regardless of your role in your local program, you need to develop some familiarity with your NEDP goals. If you're an NEDP advisor and assessor and you are not aware of that, please speak to your lead assessor or to your um, local program or to your program administrator so, so that you are aware of your goal for the year. So that our goal says that your, your local program goal should inform how you plan your, your PD. And in the state of Maryland as well, we do require all of our um, staff to have at least 10 hours of professional development activities in, in the year. That's the minimum. And at the, you know, as, as well, we're, we're also saying that your choice of professional development activities shouldn't don't only be based on, oh, the state says we should have 10 hours, so I would simply have 10 hours. We need to focus on what our needs are um, and on the, the choice of the professional development activities that you are focusing on. So here also, I wanted to talk about the Maryland uh, PD plan. You may not be familiar with this. Um, the Maryland Department of Labor has requires all of our local providers to 
um, develop a plan for professional development. And our ABE and um, ESL uh, look at programs do an excellent job of this, where they do a collaborative needs assessment, um, kind of thinking about the different areas of program operations. Perhaps the instructional specialist goes into the classrooms to observe classroom, uh, classroom activities. They do a needs assessment where they collect data. And also, um, they also do observation, um, dropping in a, cl on a classroom, just sort of looking for data to, to identify where you are, at, at where the program, you know, the, the, the gaps that may exist in program operation, whether re in, in reference to um, the type of curriculum that you are using or, or focusing on staff as well. And also there's the digital literacy aspect of it. So we know that before the pandemic, digital literacy has become very important. And NEDP is also um, a web-based uh, assessment that the, the learner uh, completes this program basically online. So coming in, they should have some basic proficiency in um, some technical skills, in computer skills, and being able to use the internet and being able to use, uh, being able to function in a digital environment. It's more than, and because we're also pre uh, preparing our NEDP uh, uh, learners for the world of work, we will be doing them a disservice actually if we're not equipping them with the digital literacy skills that they need. So these are some of the areas that we wanna look at. We're not essentially only looking at the learner because if you ask the staff, as the assessor and advisor, you're supposed to, we're supposed to be modeling uh, the appropriate behavior for our learners. So these are some of the areas that um, the, uh, the Maryland Department of Labor Plan sort of uh, takes a look at. So what are your digital literacy needs? How do you assess your, your learners' digital literacy needs? So there's also the aspect of the program outcome data that Doug will go into in greater detail where you are required to look at your uh, tables 4 and 4B. If you are an advisor and assessor, you may not be familiar with uh, table 4 and 4B, they are NRS tables, your, N, uh, your um, MIS is familiar with that and your program administrator. But this is the data that actually captures outcome. NEDP data is included in, that, in, in those tables as well. So we also look at PD participation. For instance, the state requires all providers to have, I mean, all staff members to have um, a minimum of eight hours. So where are they? Um, are they meeting that expect requirements? Um, what, what challenges there are there? So also client feedback is one of the things that, that you look at. Do you have all these surveys that you that provide feedback uh, to, the, to the local program? So there's also the, the aspect of a PD budget where um, if you are required to, to uh, complete a minimum of uh, 10 hours of, of professional development, you need to think about how many staff you have and how, to, how much um, to budget for that. So these are the, essentially the components of, of the Maryland um, labor plan. But I wanted to, to sort of mention the fact that um, as it is right now, the, the, we, we're doing our best to make that uh, Maryland kind of labor plan to be more a friend, NEDP friendly essentially. We would be, uh, now incorporate advisors and assessors so that when an NEP program sees this, they will not think, oh, it's for the instructional side of the, of the aisle. No, NEDP as well needs to sort of look at their data. We need to think uh, carefully about our labor plan, I mean, about, sorry, about our PD plan. We shouldn't make our decisions about professional development based on, uh, you know, in a vacuum. It should be based on the data that we are, um, that we are receiving and that we are collecting and that we are observing. So, thank you. So, uh, it's fine, Doug, if you want to jump in here. But oh, sure, I I'll go ahead and jump in here on this. So, um, the other thing we want to look at is increasing the communication between NEDP staff and also the other leadership staff. So, um, NEDP is a part of the whole. So, if you have a program where that's all that you do, then great. You might partner, though, with other agencies to help recruit 
uh, participants into your program. For the majority of NEDP providers, it's part of a program that also provides adult basic education and English language acquisition. So we want to make sure that we're breaking any artificial barriers or silos that exist. Advisors and assessors sometimes work very much in isolation from adult basic ed teachers or you know, the IES staff, et cetera. We want to make sure that when we're thinking about using data for NEDP and talking about professional development and so forth, that we're not putting up artificial barriers that don't need to be there. Um, what is the IAS role in intake and assess assessment? Um, are we doing uh, proper recruitment of potential clients for the NEDP program from our AB and ASC levels? Um, are we providing NEDP information for non-NEDP staff? And then also as the role of a transition specialist um, becomes more and more important, uh, in programs of varying sizes. And for some programs, that's a dedicated staff member. For some programs, it's someone that's pulling double or triple duty. Um, but as that role becomes more and more important, is NEDP part of the discussion? And so these are some of the things we wanna make sure we're keeping in mind. Now, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time um, on a technical piece. And this is going over some of the common reports that you can find both in the NEDP system as well as in our state database. So first of all, to access NEDP records, it is through myNEDP.org. For each one of your programs, there should be at least one person that has access to this system. Um, if there needs to be a change in who has access, that would go through the program administrator and through bio. Um, but I just wanna show you what's in this system in case you've never personally accessed this and you're not sure what's available. So after you log in, of course, there's a tab for reporting. And within that reporting tab, there is a slew of reports that you can pull up. Enrollment report, report our reports, participant tables, um, yearly statistical report, and so forth. Um, something that is in common uh, with uh, LACES is that, of course, you want to know your enrollment. So if you pull up the NADP report on enrollment, put in your time frame, generate it or export it to PDF, you'll see an enrollment report like this. Now, I'm looking at a Maryland version, so it would have all of the programs listed. For the local version, it would just, of course, have your own program. But it's going to tell you the number of students that are in the diagnostic phase, in the generalized assessment phase, uh, all competencies demonstrated or confirmed, your active clients, your graduates, the number that exited, and the total number served. Very useful information. If you're using LACES, and once again, I apologize if you're from a state that's not using LACES, but most likely your state database will still have some kind of way to get at this information. Um, you would log into LACES. Uh, you would access the student tab, take off the current fiscal year search and add search. I am going through this fairly quickly, but this is something that if um, after the presentation, if you do want a tutorial on how to do this, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll help you through that. Uh, you would then add a search criteria. You would want to have any student.program that starts with national. In LACES, that's an easy way to get at the National External Diploma Program students. Um, and then from there, you're going to run an NRS table. Uh, we're going to add because we want to make sure that we're running the NRS table just on NEDP clients. If you choose replace, you'll actually run the NRS table on all of the participants. So you just want to do it on the NEDP. You'll choose the reporting year and then you'll access NRS table four. Um, if you are in a program and you're working with NADP and you've never seen table four, um, I strongly encourage you to get some tutorial on this. Once again, if you're in Maryland, I'm more than happy to walk through at a later date how you can read table four. Um, but the key thing is here that we're gonna be looking at the educational functioning level on the left, um, looking of course at the higher ABE levels because I'm talking about NADP, NADP participants. And while this does not break up um, those in a, generalized assessment and those in diagnostics, it does give us the total number of participants as well as the number that have attained a secondary school diploma or its equivalent, which means that they've completed the program. Since um, the MyNDP is of course part of the adult education system in the United States, there are, is some parity between different reports. So if you go into the NEDP participant tables, you're going to see a table one, two, three, and five. These tables match the NRS tables that are in LACES or in your state system. So NEDP participant table one is the NRS table one. Table two is the NRS table two, three is the NRS table three, and five is the five. So this is another way you can look at the data and do some 
um, some troubleshooting between what's in my NDP and what's in LACES. The one thing I want to point out, though, for Maryland is that the Table 5 NEDP core follow-up outcomes and the NRS Table 5 that's in LACES, these are not going to be a fully accurate view for Maryland because, of course, the Table 5 outcomes are done at the state level, not at the local level. So while this is in the My NEDP system, I would advise that you uh, not use this table to do any kind of comparison because it's not going to have completely accurate information. Uh, we also have a demographics report. Um, this is from the ones that I just talked about here. We have a demographic report. This is table one. The only thing I want to point out here is that if you look at it on the NRS table um, from LACES, it's going to have the educational functioning levels on the left. And of course, it's going to have all of them. Um, but for NEDP, we're only looking at the higher levels. So I want to point out to you that while NEDP still uses the terminology of ASC low and ASC high, if you're looking at an official NRS table, you're going to see ABE5 and ABE6. So don't be confused by that terminology. Most of us that have been in the programs for a while, of course, know ASC low and high, but especially if you're newer, you want to look at ABE5 and ABE6 to be ASC low and ASC5, or ABC high. Now I'm just looking quickly before I go on about any questions in the chat. Um, there was a question about seeing each program's data. So unfortunately, um, I could always show you the statewide data, but to show one program's data versus another program's, that would be um, up to the individual program. So we don't share one program's data versus the other. However, I encourage you that as an NEDP team across the state, if that's something that an individual program is comfortable with sharing with other programs, that of course is the program's um, choice, but at the state level, that's not something that we're comfortable with doing. And then there was a question about what about the students that go from ABE to NEDP mid-year? Um, so Denny, um, if you're referring to where they show up on the NRS table um, in LACES, remember that they're gonna show up on the NRS table um, based on where they started the fiscal year at. So if we go back to the NRS table, um, while it's cut off here at the bottom, if the student was in uh, ABE level four in the traditional ABE program, and then they move up to uh, the NEDP program that year, their outcomes that happen, if they, for example, complete the NEDP program and get their diploma through NEDP, that outcome in NRS is going to show up on ABE level four because that was where they started the fiscal year at. Um, if it's a situation where they're in AB level four one year, they enter NEDP the following fiscal year, um, they're at AB level five based on that. It, maybe they took the CASAS test, got AB level five. That was a post test one year, but in the next year, that's now their starting test as far as LACES is concerned. Any outcomes in that next fiscal year will show up under AB level five. Um, I know that's a little confusing, but, um, but that's how it works with LACES. Okay, uh, unique reports in NEDP, one of them is the competency duration, and this is not something that um, can be brought up uh, in LACES, is um, it shows how many hours that students are working on each individual competency. It's a very interesting table. So for example, we can see under cultural literacy, understanding plagiarism, we have that um, the minimum amount of time someone spends is an hour and 15 minutes and six seconds. The maximum amount of time that a participant's taken is 16 hours. And on average, it's four hours and 47 minutes. Um, so this is some interesting data that you can pull that's only in the NEDP. There's also this yearly statistical report. Now this is another report, um, of course, this is at the year's end. And this is something that does have some overlap with what's available in LACES. Um, but I just kind of want to point out what's in here. So we have here that we have all of the enrollment information. So this is kind of a summary of what was on one of the other tables, the students that are in the diagnostic phase in generalized assessment, graduated and so forth. But also importantly, it has the number of students that exited the diagnostic and exited the generalized assessment that year, uh, student gender. Um, and then I've kind of briefly put the other parts on here. It has students' ethnicity, their race, their age range. Remember this age range, 16 to 18, 19 to 24, 25 to 44. Remember, these are not consistent age ranges. However, they do match the NRS age ranges. So if you wanted to use this to compare what's in LACES, you can do that. 
their highest level of education, uh, their labor force status, and their reasons for enrollment, primary goal, additional goals, and follow-up information. And then of course, table J, reasons for exiting before completion. We don't always have this information, but if that's something that we do have, it's important that this gets moved into the system as well. So of course, that was a very, very quick overview of some of the um, reports that are in LACES and reports that are in NEDP. Um, I didn't wanna to spend too much time on it because I wanna spend some time talking about how we could use them. Um, but if any of you that are on this presentation, if you'd like to know a little bit more about what's available, um, if you're interested in what's available in NEDP and you're not currently someone that uses the My NEDP system, um, I would encourage you to reach out to your NEDP colleagues or reach out to me or bio to do a little bit more with that. If you're someone that doesn't use LACES or you're not familiar about how NEDP shows up with LACES, please feel free to reach out to me um, or the help desk at LACES. So now let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about how we can use these reports. So of course, before I go into showing you some of our thoughts, um, I would like to know what your thoughts are. So how do you think you could use these reports? And I put the Poll Everywhere link again in the, um, the chat box, but take a minute and I'm not gonna interrupt you and think about looking at all of these NRS tables and LACES, the NRS tables um, in NEDP and some of the other NEDP reports and ask yourself, what could you do with these and how can they help you with communication, outcomes, reporting, PD, et cetera? And Rita, I see your question in the chat. Um, after we go over this slide here, I'm gonna uh, ask if Bio has the answer to that question. So just wanna let you know, we're not uh, ignoring you. So some of the answers coming in, we can use it to identify program gaps, better drive instruction for students, okay, to track distance learning hours. Give you another minute or so, take your time. And if you're not sure how you can use it, feel free to say that. So distance learning hours, developing professional development around results, okay. This is all new for us, not sure, not a problem. Okay, looking forward to what we have to say, not a problem. We're almost there. So while people are finishing answering that bio, would you be able to answer uh, Rita's question? Rita asked, um, we're finding a wide range of how long it takes students to complete a program. Um, how is the time on task calculated? So for example, if a student opens a program and walks away, does that count as time? Do we know the answer to that? Well, the best that I was thinking about, uh, if Rita's question is um, about how do you determine the average number of time that it takes the, a client to complete the program? I know that CESAS has this data out there and I'm not sure how they calculated it that it takes an average of six to, uh, to 10 months or six to 12 months for um, somebody to, to complete it. But from the time that the, the client begins diagnostics, when you actually signed them up for NEDP, till the time that they exited. That would be, to, that's like a period of participation. Um, if they signed up um, in January, um, I, I, I mean, they began diagnostic in January and for whatever reason, they didn't finish, they, they exited in, let's say in December, that's like it's taking them 12, uh, about 12 months to, to it's, they've been in the program for 12 months. For, so for any DP, it's when the clients actually began um, the began diagnostic to when they when they completed generalized assessment. That time frame there. So it's now, good Rita, to define. I think if I'm if if I could jump in for a second, you're talking about how long it takes for someone to complete a competency, right? Like the report says, okay, it took a student four hours and forty five minutes to complete a competency. Are you talking about like? 
how is that counted? Like if a student logs in and they're not actually doing anything in the system, like if they log in at noon, but they don't actually do anything until 1230, do they get credit for that 30 minutes of time? Is that what you're talking about, Rita? So I sort of have a thought about what she's saying as well. If there's 133 hours of time on task, there's a potential that the student wasn't best fit for NEDP. And so I think that that needs to be a part of the conversation in, in terms of you know, even recruitment and retention and things like that. Um, but it becomes a larger conversation on the best ways to support the students. Once they are enrolled in NEDP, how do we help them to achieve that next competency. Right. That's and I certainly don't have all the answers, but um, if somebody so is would... spending 133 hours, I'm thinking that's very substantive. Thanks, Gina. I think that's a lot um, on one competency, especially if somebody uh, is able to, has been able to complete that in half the, the amount of time. Uh, so evidently that student's struggling uh, with something there. Okay. And Rita, I think what we'll do is we'll find out for you for, you for sure um, how long is it before, say, CASAS actually logs someone out of the system, you know, if they're inactive. Noemi said she thinks that there is uh, there's something in there that logs what they're doing and will log them out, but we'll find that answer out for you just for sure. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go on to our thoughts on what you can do with this data. So first of all, um, look at the attrition trend data. So look at when the students are leaving the program and see if you're having any kind of um, any kind of trends that going on with that. So for example, um, what are the what's a percentage of students that exited during the diagnostic phase over those past five years? What's a percentage of students that exited during the generalized assessment phase over this past five years? If you're seeing some kind of a trend, either going up or going down, then the next question is, well, why are they leaving during that time? You may be able to get in touch with the student, you may not, but if it's something that you're seeing that is negatively affecting your program, you need to do some investigation to find out why they're leaving because so much of NEDP is getting students into the program and then keeping them motivated but you have all that going on without the benefit of having an instructor seeing them say six hours a week and working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so that's something you really need to work on. And also when you do this, I want you to keep in mind that the percentage is independent of the total enrollment numbers. And I'm gonna show you what I mean here. Here's some state data on students that are leaving the program. So this is the number of students that exited NEDP in Maryland during the diagnostic phase. So we see that from fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 20, um, it's a decrease. We're seeing that there are actually fewer students that are leaving the program, which sounds like a great thing. But the problem is you have to keep in mind that we also have fewer students that are enrolling in the program to begin with. So in this case, you shouldn't really look at the total number of students that are exiting, but the percentage of students that are exiting. So if I redo this chart and do it as a percentage, we see that from fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 20, we're between four and 6% of students that are leaving during the diagnostic phase. And we don't really have a trend going on there. So we can look at this and say, well, from the state of Maryland overall, the percentage of students that are resting during diagnostic is almost flat. So there's really not a lot we can learn about that other than it's between four and 6%. Another way to look at this is let's look at that for generalized assessment people, the people that leave during the generalized assessment phase. Here we see from FY16 to FY20, um, there has been in general, a slight decrease in students that are leaving the generalized assessment phase as a percentage. So that's actually a good thing. So even though we know that the number of students in the program has been going down overall, the percentage of those students that are leaving during generalized assessment has actually gone from a height here in FY17, and it's actually gone down a little bit over time from around 23%, and now we're looking at around 16 or 17%. That's great. If I were a local program and this were my data, I would say, have I done something different um, during that time to help students become uh, more attached and keep persisting through the program? Something else to look at is demographic data. Compare the demographic trends of your program. 
male versus female enrollment, ethnicity, race, age, et cetera. Why have those numbers changed? Has the demographics of your area changed? Is your program matching that change in demographics? Um, are you losing in one demographic area, but making gains in another, or maybe not making gains in another? Are you reaching out to your target populations? If you're seeing that the percentage of your students that are ESL students is increasing, non-native English speakers are increasing in your area, are you seeing that reflected in the percentage enrolling in NEDP, or are you not reaching out to that population? Do we need to shift our marketing strategies? To give you an example of what that data could look like, um, looking at the age distribution, these five charts are showing us the age distribution in the state of Maryland. Um, I know it's a little bit hard to see. What I've done is I pulled out the piece of the pie that is specifically for the 19 to 24 year old group. So we see that in FY16, the 19 to 24 year olds represented 19% of our data. In 17, that was 19.8. In FY18, that was 19.8. But then over the past two years, the 19 to 24 year old group has become a smaller piece of our overall population. So as a state, the question would be, okay, are we having difficulty reaching out to this population? So this would be the group of students that have recently withdrawn from high school. Um, are we not reaching out to them properly? Or the opposite could be, are the other groups increasing in size? So these are things that can help us when it comes to considering marketing our programs. Now, Abaya is gonna talk a little bit about how we can use this with professional development. Thank you, Doug. Um, just to, to sort of um, share a, a, some additional information about some of the uh, sources of information and data that would inform professional development activities that we engage in. Um, NEDP, as we know, has um, is different from your regular instructional, I mean, adult ed education program. But when uh, um, NEDP learners come into our local programs, they participate in the same information system that in, in information session rather that, uh, that other uh, potential uh, clients or, or, or um, students participate in. Um, NEDP learners, a lot of them when they come in actually may not have heard about NEDP, but during the information session is when NEDP is introduced to them. So it is important at that point um, that they hear the right information is for them to be able to make a decision to decide whether NEDP is, is right for them. At this point, they have not um, had the opportunity to, to, to take um, the standardized test that they need to, to determine placement, but they need to know about the program, the requirements to see whether it will fit into their lifestyle. So this is one of the one activity that could be observed. What type of information are we presenting to, to, to learners? Um, if, some of if um, potential uh, students come to your local program and they're not even hearing much about NEDP, if everything they hear is about GED, because most of them when they come in, they've already heard about GED testing. They're not even aware that there's another um, option that is out there. So providing the right information and the different, um, enough information essentially, I should say, that they need not to overwhelm them with information. Um, but something that, that is enough for them to be able to make a decision. So that's something that we need to look at. What information are we providing? And then the other thing that we could look at is um, we could look at the competency area that um, review the competency areas that the um, assessors um, reviewing. How are they reviewing uh, the competency area? How responsive are they in terms of um, you know, providing feedback to the clients in their portfolio review, because there's that aspect of interaction between the advisor, I mean, sorry, the assessor and also the client. That interaction is very important. What type of a feedback are you giving them? How are you referring them to uh, for remediation? And um, how responsive are you in general? And then the other aspect that is really critical, especially in this, in this environment is um, the inner office check. Now the NEDP um, is like, as I indicated, is done um, in an in a online capacity. Before, uh, maybe before six months ago, we, the clients needed to come in to do um, what they call the inner office check in a face-to-face -face situation with the, with the assessor. Because the, the, most of the work is completed individually by the clients at home when nobody's actually monitoring. So there's no way, there's no way for, 
anybody to actually know whether somebody did the work for you. So the IOC is a, if a way to really do that um, check and balance essentially to be sure that the work is being completed by the client. So just to, to ensure that the IOC is being conducted according to the policies and procedures that CASAS has set, you, may, you, you could observe an IOC session. How is this, this done? Is, is it being done? Now that it's in a virtual environment, it is possible to do it in a virtual environment. This can also be observed and um, look at how um, it's been done to see whether there's room for improvement. And also professional development is another area that you can look at, as I indicated earlier. Is there somebody in your agency who is actually tracking a professional development hours? Um, how do you know whether one of your staff members has actually completed this and what type of professional development hours are they involved in? What consequences are, are there, if any, um, if somebody does not complete, meet this requirement? And also there's the client evaluation of any DP advisor and assessor. Just the same way that the students in an adult education class um, would do an evaluation of their instructor to provide feedback to see areas where their client, I mean, their teacher could improve essentially. So um, are, you, are we also doing an evaluation of, I mean, are the clients also evaluating their assessor, their experiences with their assessor? These activities can actually provide a good data for us to, to um, for us to focus on prov program improvement. So, so I know we're almost out of time and my cats decided to photobomb us. So I'm gonna quickly talk about some ideas on using professional development with the data. Um, remember your professional development needs to be focused on student outcomes. So that has to always be the guiding principle professional development. But because a lot of us come from traditional programs that have AB and ESL, we're so focused on improving instruction which for those parts of the program we should be. But when it comes to NEDP, we might have to have a different thought process when it comes to what's an important professional development that's gonna help our NEDP program. So for example, changing in program demographics maybe could indicate a need for changing our marketing strategies. So maybe you need to be creative about what kind of professional development do you need on marketing? And I don't mean you bring in a marketing professional, but how to reach out to potential NEDP clients that you um, you may not be able to do just by making a flyer and distributing it around your, your community. Um, retention challenges, you can have PD on motivation and engagement. Um, if you're seeing that you're having challenges in a diagnostic phase, maybe you need to work on the intake and orientation model with the intake assessment specialist, and that could result in some kind of professional development on how to run really positive um, orientations that really go over the NATP process. Um, professional development, digital literacy, staff engagement, and so forth. Now, of course, all of these things seem to be approved, and that's you know part of what Gina does whenever you do your professional development. But my point is, think about how you do PD, and feel free to be creative. Throw out some ideas, but ask yourself: Are these student focused? Are these helping with the student outcomes? If they are, then there's a good chance that's something that would be allowable to improve your program. Um, I'm sorry, I'm at the cut bio off because I know we're at 1258, but I just want to go through here. We have um, ways to identify your PD topic. So when you get a copy of this, it has all of these links on here for you, but make sure you take a holistic approach to it. And also um, we have a professional development, create an action plan and bio. I think this is something, could you go over this just very briefly? Yeah, essentially it's sort of, um, a, a sort of puts a final note, touch on some of the things that we have been talking about that it is important after hearing all of this to have an action plan because things don't happen unless they are made to happen. It's just, it's just talking about the intentionality that needs to be involved here, especially the same thing that you are doing for your ABE and ESL, you need to do the same thing for your NEDP um, program. So, so that's, so thank you so much for attending. I know we kind of ran out of time. We will get you the answer to the CASAS time on task um, log inactivity um, question. But if you have any other questions, this is bio and my email address on there. And I'm gonna turn it over to Gina. I think you have one or two last things. Yes, um, so as everyone knows, all of our sessions are recorded and they will be up on our website. I'm hoping before the end of the month, including a copy of the presentation and any handouts that are necessary during 
the um, presentation. This one, none specifically, but any of the other ones. <laughs> love the cat bomb. Millie, I always love the cat bomb too. Um, I put a um, link in the chat box, but I'll go ahead and do it again since so many people are thanking our wonderful Doug and Bio for their presentation. Um, but if you can take a moment to complete this survey for us, um, we can't grow if we don't know. So if the Virtual Training Institute is offering things you like or you don't like, um, this survey is anonymous and it allows you to provide honest feedback, which I always welcome. Um, I want to take a second to thank everyone for participating in today's session um, and really asking great questions. Um, you know, we're, we uh, live for the, the positive participation. And I am just really interested how people get emojis in their responses. That smiley face is lovely. Yesterday, I saw a peace sign and I'm very jealous. So thank you so much for, see, Doug, you get a regular smiley. I don't know how you get the cool smile. Yeah, how does that work? I don't know. I'm jealous. Um, I'll have to Google that. Um, I'll do my own professional development on Zoom emojis. I don't know. But anyways, thank you guys so much for participating today. And I hope everyone has a wonderful and safe holiday and um, a, a much more uneventful 2021. Thank you.